Far from civilization at the end of the earth, a land lays uninhabited by humankind. Those who dare travel here find a crucible of such intensity unknown to others. With a harsh climate whose temperature regularly sits below freezing, only the most resilient of creatures can survive here. Today, we'll be making an expedition to this distant land. Everyone who thinks they can brave the conditions, hop on our dog sled and away we'll go. This episode of Cinema Nippon was requested by YouTube user Manuel Smith, who requested that we cover something by director Kuroyoshi Kurahara. Thanks for the recommendation, Manuel. Given Kurahara's background, which we'll get into, you might be expecting one type of film. But today, we're going to take a peek at this memorable filmmaker from the second peak in his career, rather than the first. Today, we're taking a look at the 1983 big-budget blockbuster, Antarctica. To understand Antarctica, we should first examine the man leading the project, Koryoshi Kurahara. Kurahara is remembered as one of the more prolific members of the Japanese New Wave. His early work, which began in 1957, is noted for its youthful and harsh nature, similar to the work of other directors like Nagisa Oshima. We covered Oshima at the end of last year with his late period film Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. Unlike some of Kurahara's New Wave contemporaries, who were teenagers when World War II concluded, Kurahara was born in 1927, making him of age to be drafted. He joined the Imperial Navy and remained in Japan, never being deployed nor seeing any action in the course of his service. After the conclusion of World War II, Kurahara studied at the Japan University of Art, from which he graduated in 1952. He then joined Shochiku and inadvertently met Ishiro Honda, director of Godzilla. Through this connection, Kurahara became an apprentice to Kajiro Yamamoto, who you might recall from last week's episode on Godzilla was the mentor of Honda and Akira Kurosawa. Following this apprenticeship, Kurahara joined Nikatsu, where he worked as a crew member on Crazed Fruit, one of Ko Nakahara's proto-new wave efforts which would inspire not only Kurahara's work in the 1960s, but also the youth films of Nagisa Oshima, among others. Later in life, like many new wave directors, Kurahara slowed his production rate. In the 70s and 80s, he went into television and documentary work, occasionally returning to feature filmmaking. In 1981, he co-directed Gate of Youth with Kinji Fukusaku, prominent Yakuza director. The following year, Kurahara directed the follow-up Part 2 on his own. And then, in 1983, Kurahara unleashed one of his best-known films, Antarctica. Antarctica, or South Pole Story as its original title translates, was a labor of love, with a remarkable production period behind it. The plot of the film details the story of the Japanese Antarctica research expedition, between late 1957 and early 1959. During this period, the expedition experienced unexpectedly harsh weather conditions, which forced them to abandon their newly set up base. Due to ships being unable to reach the base, the team evacuated by air, with the plan to return soon afterward to retrieve a team of Sakhalin Huskies who they had brought to help with manual labor. However, conditions worsened even further, leading the expedition to abandon the base entirely for a full year. The film dramatizes these true events, following both the two scientists who are in charge of the Huskies and the dogs during the year for which they were left to their own devices, before the expedition was set to return. It's a tale of hope as well as perseverance, raising questions as to the morality of abandoning the dogs at the base. At times, it is a film which is difficult to watch due to its toughened nature. In a manner which is most apropos, it was also a film which was difficult to create. The film, like the period over which its events occur, took several years to produce. Photography occurred in Hokkaido, Antarctica, and Canada, with all three locations being effectively composited to create the image of a single location. Not only did it take an exceptionally long time to shoot, Antarctica has also been noted for being expensive. Reportedly, the film cost between 2 and 3 billion yen, which was between 8.5 and 13 million US dollars at the time, which in today's money is between roughly 20 and 30 million US dollars. Compare this to 2011's The Tale of Princess Kaguya, which is reportedly the most expensive Japanese film to date, with an estimated cost of over 49 million US dollars. Even today, an average big budget production only gets about 2 billion yen, which is the equivalent of about 1.7 billion yen in 1983 money. Several production companies turned the film down, stating that it was too expensive and too big of a risk. Kurahara and company approached Fuji TV, who were ready to greenlight the project as one for television. 
As a saving grace, Purina approached the filmmakers with an interest in investing in the film, at which point Fuji TV got nervous and reversed their demands. It would seem that, although the film was a risk, in the case that it might be a hit, Fuji wanted their name on it. In the end, Fuji TV put up the money for the film, and production commenced and took place between 1981 and 1983. For Antarctica, a base was constructed in Canada's snowbound region. Modeled after the JARE's first South Pole establishment, Shoa Base, built in 1957. The filmmakers painstakingly transposed the true story of this animal drama onto film, giving a large portion of the runtime to the dogs exclusively. For these portions of the film, narration is provided, giving the audience the sense that they're watching a nature documentary. What's more, a masterful score was provided by Vangelis, hot off the success of his scores for Blade Runner and Chariots of Fire. Combine these elements with the fact that Antarctica is based on a true story, and you have a recipe for duping your audience into buying the drama of the film wholesale. Following release, Antarctica, in a similar fashion to Godzilla, completely smashed expectations. It became a runway hit, which is credited with paving the way for other animal dramas throughout the 1980s, like the Burmese Harp and the Adventures of Milo and Otis. At release, Antarctica is reported to have garnered 5.9 billion yen in earnings, more than making back its budget. The film also swept several nominations at the Japanese Academy Awards the following year, among them being the awards for cinematography and lighting, as well as Best Picture. In the end, however, this major award went to Shohei Imamura's The Ballad of Narayama. Antarctica did take home one win, however, with a popular performer award shared between the two leads, Taro and Jiro. Like we said, about half of the film may detail the lives of the scientists who trained the dogs before leaving them, but the real stars here are the Sakhalin Huskies. And it's through these perky pups that we can begin to explore why exactly Antarctica resonated so strongly with its Japanese audience. As stated before, the events of the film, while dramatized, are based in truth. The two main human characters, Ochi and Ushioda, are played by Ken Takakura, a major film star whose career lasted a number of decades, and Tsunehiko Watase, a two-time winner of the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. These two are modeled after two members of JARE's 1957 overwinter expedition, Toru Kikuchi and Taiichi Kitamura. One was a graduate of Kyoto University, while the other was a professor emeritus at Kyushu University. Kikuchi, in an essay on the production of the film, explains that while the names of the crew were changed for Antarctica, all of the events which can be known are truthful. This is likely thanks to both men having produced several books apiece about the expedition and the dogs who survived the year alone, and Kitamura's direct involvement in the film. Director Kodayoshi Kurahara was in contact with Kitamura during the film's planning stages and helped with pre-production duties. It was actually Kitamura's idea to shoot in the North Pole for some of the film's key scenes, as he had moved there in 1968 and lived there until passing away in 2006. Thus, all of the scenes involving human characters, while dramatized, are truthful. The scenes involving the dogs, meanwhile, were constructed through inference. Several of the dogs were found having died at the base, while six escaped but were never found. The corpses discovered at the base did not show signs of cannibalism, meaning that the dogs did not resort to eating one another. And since most of the others weren't found, it could not be entirely determined what the dogs ate. However, given that the two industrious pups mentioned above, Taro and Jiro, survived 13 months on their own in Antarctica, they had to eat something. Thus, the film fills the time of their stay at the base with scenes of them hunting, Something that cannot be known to have happened for certain, but which is a pretty solid inference on the filmmakers' parts. The film also explores the fallout of the JARE team leaving the dogs behind. The Japanese Antarctica Research Expedition was established in 1956, with Shoah Base's construction finishing the following year. Their duties continue today, having extended into numerous fields, like ice core analysis, meteorite research, ozone observation, and examination of climate change. In the elapsed years, in fact, three more bases have been constructed by the JARE in 1970, 1985, and 1995. Sakhalin Huskies, a breed originating in northern Japan and Russia, and bred for their sturdiness and industriousness in cold climates, 
were used as sled dogs by the expedition before and after the events seen in the film. True to history, in the film we see that a memorial is erected in honor of the dogs who were assumed to have perished in the expedition's year-long absence. And, true to form, both Ochi and Ushioda, the scientists' stand-ins, attend the unveiling of this memorial. What the film doesn't show, however, is that in actuality a number of memorials were put up. The Japan Animal Welfare Society assisted in putting up 15 monuments to the dogs in 1959, with the most notable being in Hokkaido and at the base of Tokyo Tower. What's more, given their status as a symbol of Japanese endurance and pride, once Taro and Jiro passed away, they were taxidermed and placed in the botanical gardens of Hokkaido University and the National Science Museum in Ueno, Tokyo, respectively. Both due to this sympathetic cause and due to the surprising survival of two of the 15 dogs, the Sakhalin Husky became a popular breed in Japan in the 1960s. This popularity resurged in the 1980s, following the release of Antarctica. This popularity lasted well into the 1990s. As of 2011, however, the breed, which has never been officially recognized by any major kennel club, is thought to be effectively extinct, with only three known living individuals. While the truth behind the events may have resonated with audience within Japan, international audiences can find something in the emotion of Antarctica. At its heart, the film focuses on the strength of the spirit, both the human spirit and the dog spirits, and the bonds that we form with one another and with animals. We see in the first half hour of the film, before the base is abandoned, that the JARE members work with the dog team, rather than using them for their strength. The men don't view the dogs as tools, but as intelligent and emotional beings, appealing on more than one occasion to these qualities to communicate between species. As one of the scientists explains, this is different from Japan, this is Antarctica, only the tough survive. The humans understand that they need these dogs to survive, and in turn the dogs actually save them when the team is stricken by snow blindness and need to be guided back to the base. The men who have been blinded have the chance to travel back in the truck which comes to pick them up, but instead elect to stay with the sled, in the harsh elements, with the dogs. In short, the adversity presented by the environment allows the dogs and the men to grow closer, which in turn makes their parting that much more heart-wrenching. The first half hour of the film doesn't provide much in the way of story, and instead exists as a prelude to the film proper, where we grow to understand how the men and the dogs interact. Then, when the first proper act comes in and they are separated, we as an audience are primed for the emotional roller coaster that the two separate storylines present. We then witness on both sides the emotional and physical endurance that the humans and the dogs exhibit, both in Antarctica and Japan. This strength is born of the bond between the two and the need to persevere in the hope of seeing one another again. And this is the true beauty of Antarctica that a true story of such strength is used to show us, no matter what we're going through, there's always a reason to keep going. Following Antarctica, Koryoshi Kurahara didn't take part in that many more film productions. His final effort was the 1995 TV movie Hiroshima, which Kurahara co-directed with Roger Spottiswood. While Antarctica may not detail the youthful, brash nature of the Japanese new wave that Kurahara helped to define several decades before, it remains a significant film nonetheless due to its box office success and its influence. Not only did it popularize the Sakhalin Husky as a breed for a time within the country, and retain its position as the highest grossing domestic film until 1997, when Princess Mononoke dethroned it, Antarctica also garnered international attention, due to both Evangelis' notable soundtrack and to the 2006 pseudo-remake by Disney, Eight Below, which is credited partially to Kurahara. Unfortunately, the film might be remembered for its box office success, but it has failed to see any sort of major respect in the West. While Antarctica had a VHS release over here in the 1980s, it has since fallen largely into obscurity. This could be in part due to the American Humane Association deeming the film unacceptable due to two scenes of the dogs hunting being questionable. The AHA doesn't seem to have taken issue with any scenes involving the dogs acting injured, accepting Kurahada's explanation that anesthetic was administered for these portions. Instead, they questioned whether a seal, which is seen being attacked, and a skua, which is seen being eaten, were attacked or killed by the filmmakers, as no record of humane practices in filming these scenes seems to exist. 
Whatever the reason for this obscurity in the West, and even if the tale of Taro, Jiro, and the J-A-R-E has slowly passed into history, Antarctica is a notable picture for Japanese film study for a number of different reasons. It was the highest grossing film in the nation for nearly 15 years. It's the story of triumph both in front of and behind the camera, and it can help us learn about the odd career of one of Japan's loose canon directors of two decades prior. The film is available on Blu-ray in Japan, and fan subtitles are readily available in English. Check this one out for the stunning photography, the convincing special effects, the memorable 80s synth soundtrack. At the very least, check out the soundtrack, which is easily available in the West. And for the heartstring-tugging true story on display. Once more, we would like to thank Manuel Smith for recommending we cover something by Koreyoshi Kurahara. We get the feeling that given Kurahara's memory as a new wave director, this might not have been the period about which Manuel wanted to hear. If that's the case, then don't fear, because in the course of researching this episode, we also picked up Criterion's collection of five of Kurahara's earlier new wave works, some of which we'll certainly be getting to later.